most societies and we definitely have a lot uh, of room and an opportunity to continue to become more equal but I see women in every space that there is so if you follow that circular economy all the way around however you look at it women are at each part of that we're business owners we're decision makers we're legislators we're consumers we're community members we're mothers we're sisters we're daughters you know we're all of those things um, and I think that we're seeing that more and more everywhere and especially in Ghana as well. So thank you for that very valuable input. For those of you joining us today, I'm Cordy Aziz, the founder and executive director of Environment 360. And thank you for joining our conversation on women in the circular economy. Um, we were just discussing what is a circular economy and what is the role of women? One of the things that Ajua pointed out is that she, as you are looking at the value collection chain, you do actually see a lot of the women at the collection side. But when it comes to aggregating, processing, uh, owning recycling facilities, there's still a large deficit. How do you think that we can change that? Uh, and what are some of the strategies you would recommend? We can start okay. with you, Heather. Okay, so do I come in, please? Yes, we can start with you as well, Betty. Okay. Okay, so... Uh, yes, I would put it in the Ghanaian, into the Ghanaian perspective, for example. I'm very happy that Ajua mentioned that, you know, we have a lot of women lurking around the lower end of the value chain. And it is very important that we are deliberate about pushing them at least to the aggregation and recycling stage on the value chain. Um, I think that over time, there has not been any deliberate, you know, affirmative action based support for women. Um, on the circular economy value chain, and we really need to look at that. Um, there has also been a low level of research and development. For example, if you don't have um, data on the impact on, of, for example, gender mainstreaming in, in the sector, how then do you create targeted, you know, uh, uh, action-based policies to support these women uh, on the value chain, okay? There's also the need for, for or the political will, you know, that will be required to, to even help support the uh, secondary materials that these women produce. Because there's a lot of public perception about um, um, uh, raw materials or finished products that is waste-based. And so a lot of these women, after you have invested a lot of time and energy in producing, find it very difficult to even market your products because of public perception. So I am just trying to say that government will have to be very intentional about deliberate affirmative action policies and programs to support women who are on the value chain as well. And I think it's interesting that you mentioned uh, policies and government because we know that Heather is actually uh, supporting and working with the government on the Ghana National Action uh, Plastic Partnership. Heather, um, can you address some of the concerns that maybe uh, Miss Betty has had? And can you let us know if some of these things are maybe on the horizon uh, in the plastic uh, action plan? Yeah, I can confirm that these uh, these issues and gaps are true and we see them in science uh, and science-based evidence. So through the, the Ghana National Plastic Action Partnership over almost a year now, maybe around nine months, well, we've been supporting a national baseline assessment of gender roles across the plastics value chain. So go all the way from very upstream to downstream and seeing um, the profile of the industry, the different places, and what are women's role in them. And I don't have direct statistics. I'd be really happy to share uh, the final outputs, which are, are they're not officially available, but I could share a soft um, pre-version with you. But what we find is that women are very heavily concentrated at the, the, the end of the value chain, so in collection and recycling, and specifically in the informal economy. So where they do a bulk of the work there, they're not recognized, they're not identified, and they don't have support mechanisms. So how we intend to utilize this information to support policy formation and creating proactive, intentional policies. I really like that you use that word, Betty. We have to intentionally push these women up the value chain is being able to pull out 
um, specific recommendations and clear interventions in the short, medium, and long term that can most rapidly address those objectives uh, and putting those in front of policymakers and decision makers, not only in context of waste policy, plastic policy, but also related to gender policy and industrial development policy. And so looping all those things together and putting it uh, on the agenda, hopefully at, at one of the highest levels. Um, and so there'll be opportunities to engage with this work for, for other stakeholders who'd like to have an opportunity to vet it, to see if it's really accurate or how you could maybe utilize it within your institutions or help us uh, create more awareness about it. And so we'll be organizing um, uh, an opportunity to engage with the material, I think in the next two months or so, and we'll make sure to reach out to everyone here uh, if you'd like to participate. Thank you so much for that, Heather. And I think that this is a great time to actually go to Ajua because Ajua not only is the country manager for Dow, but Ajua is also the president of Gripe. So Ajua, when it comes to inclusiveness and support of waste pickers, we know that the Ghana Recycling Initiative by Private Enterprise has a long history of supporting some of these initiatives. Do you guys have inclusive frameworks that you use or apply to projects uh, when you're thinking about executing? Cordy, that's a very, very good question. And, you know, unfortunately, Gripe does not have a framework that is inclusive. And I think that is a gap that we definitely need to address. Um, you heard Heather just mention the fact that a gender mainstreaming activity is happening at the, um, at the Ghana NPAP level. And I think this presents a clear opportunity for us to take that data and figure out how we can help to address some of those gaps um, with women within this, um, this, this uh, waste value chain. And so for us at Gripe, um, we've definitely been connected into the, in the past with um, organizations that deal directly with women in this space like Weagle, where during the COVID period um, through Weagle, we helped to make a donation to waste pickers um, as we knew that during that time they were quite vulnerable and um, even out of work in most instances. And so we saw an opportunity to do that, but there is a longer term play, I feel, um, within including it as a strategic part of our, um, our ambition as Gripe. And as Heather touched on actually, you know, the GHN PAP has created a platform for all of us to come together collaboratively to help solve the plastic waste management issues in Ghana. And the outcomes that we are tracking in that platform all have gender considerations. And so I think that this is not now um, a nice to have, it's essentially something that will be included strategically in everything that we do. And picking off uh, on your question before about how we can help address these gaps with women. There are two very tangible ones that I, I have had in mind for quite a while now. And one of them falls within the policy space. So we know that solid waste management in Ghana at the moment happens with public private partnerships. Within other economy contexts, sometimes within the, the tender or the, um, RFP process for getting into one of those uh, partnerships, they put a, a clause in there to say, what is the representation of women within your company or a certain demographic based on what they are looking for? So I think for us, there is a clear opportunity um, to ensure that within these tender processes with the government, one of those asks of the companies that step forward to, um, to engage in these public private partnerships could be that they have maybe a board representation of women or a certain percentage of women that actually work in those companies. And that's a very tangible way to ensure that um, women start to be elevated in that space. And then I think the second um, tangible one comes from the private sector and maybe even a little bit of the public sector side there is upskilling that is needed, right? Um, it, it's not, you know, women, women um, in most cases are not at that part of the value chain, that lower part of the value chain by choice. Um, it's really how the system has been created and the skills that they lack to be able to move up in the chain. And so for us, I think there is a clear opportunity to support that uh, upskilling process to ensure that they can move further up the value chain and increase um, the visibility and the diversity and inclusion of the chain um, as you move higher. So I just wanted to 
add those two examples, but um, thank you very much, Cordy, for drawing out the fact that um, Gripe as an organization can definitely be more deliberate about including a strategic framework for gender within our work. Thank you so much for your response. For those of you joining, I'm Cordy Aziz, the Founder and Executive Director of Environment 360. And we have three wonderful women today as we discuss the role of women in the circular economy. Uh, we're joined by Madam Betty Brown, the General Manager of IRECOP, uh, Madam Adwa Coleman, the Africa Sustainability and Advocacy Man Manager, as well as Country Manager of Dow, as well as Madam Heather Troutman, the Program Manager of Ghana National Plastic Action Partnership. Now, one of the interesting things that you said, Ajwa, to perhaps address some of the disparities is having RFPs that really look at how many women are engaged within your waste management services. Uh, but even as a woman-owned company, uh, I struggle to find women who are interested in waste. How can we actually encourage more young women uh, to take up this? Um, Madam Betty Brown, perhaps we start with you because you also are an MD of a waste management company. Do you often find that women shy away um, from positions at your, your company or are they more inclined to do things that maybe aren't as field work like public relations or background work? What has been your experience and how do you think we can uh, excite more women about participating in waste? Right, that's a very good question and thank you very much, Cody. That has been one of my, my biggest uh, 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 issues I have ever encountered since I joined this industry. You don't have a lot of women expressing interest in the waste management sector, for example, because of public perception, you know, uh, about, about waste management. Um, here in Aricop, we, I think the um, our gender segregation statistics states are 70 to 30. So we have 70% male and we have 30% female. And even the 30% female would want to stay at the low end of the value chain where they do only segregation. But at the executive level, for example, you just have about six women, you know, at the administrative, on the administrative level uh, 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 of the organization. And for me, I think it's a huge challenge. And there is the need for us to want to train, for example, uh, women to to operate the wheel loaders at the facility and to do all those uh, roles that has been tagged male roles, for example. And so in October, we'll be rolling out um, a program where we will train female uh, uh, drivers to be able to uh, 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 use the wheel loaders and all those heavy duty equipment at the facility. Yes, there's the need also for us to make the value chain exciting. For example, if any woman came into this facility and that segregation, are we going to quantify the risk that the person is going to, to uh, 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 be exposed to as, as some form of equity or, or reward for the person? How are we paying these women on the lower end of the value chain to make it even exciting? I have always said that we pay about 600% above the minimum wage because we quantify risk exposure of these women as part of their remuneration here at IRECOP. Um, there's, the, there's the need also to dignify what they do. For example, if we could get Corvette and VTI and all those people to certify you know, uh, some of these roles. So you, you are women, you go for training, you are certified and you are a certified sorter, a certified this, a certified that, and you are, you are exposed to best, best practices in the industry and you are able to lay bare also on what you do. Then it, 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 it dignifies the role rather than the way we are going about it. So as of now, it is like, yes, a woman is anywhere. She doesn't have anything to do and a job is offered and she takes it. But how are we deliberately dignifying these roles so it can attract a lot more women into the sector? I think you made some idea. excellent points and I love your idea with getting MBTI and other training institutes involved in really making it a more formalized and more dignified yes. process when you're looking Another at Another thing is that um, it is very, very expensive, very, very expensive migrating higher on the value chain. For example, you don't, if you want to go into high-tech recycling, 
you will need so much thousands and of, of euros to be able to do that. You see, and that is why even in the national sanitation policy, they, they have made it bare that look, government will interface with you on BOO, BOOT and all that, all those PPP models. But how are we empowering our women, for example, uh, when it comes to access to finance, to be able to also migrate themselves on the value chain, like I was saying uh, in my previous uh, 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 submission. All we have to do, and what we have to do is to be intentional about these uh, uh, gender issues and to mainstream a lot of women into the sector than we are currently doing. Thank you for that, Madam Betty Brown. So now I want to go to Madam uh, Ajua before I go to Heather, because you're coming from the private sector uh, and you have quite a mighty title, Ajua, when you look at it, uh, your country manager, as well as Africa sustainability and advocacy manager. So what do you think you can do to get more women or, or what is the strategy that we take to get more women interested uh, in careers uh, and ways, particularly at an influencer level where you are in your current position? Um, very, very good question, Cordy. And to be honest, if you had asked me maybe 10 years ago if I thought I would be working in waste, quote unquote, now, I would say no. We're all there <laughs> <And>, with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's, it's for the very simple fact that there isn't a visibility of of what you can do within the waste space, right? It's not something that people wake up and think about. It's not something that you would ask a child, what do you want to be one day? And then they'll say, oh, I want to, I want to work in waste because it's, it's, not, it's, not, um, it's not visible. It's, it's not structured. It's not, it's not put out there. And so for me, um, actually coming into this space was I think an evolution of my career, right? I work for a company that makes things and my company said, okay, we're making things and we're involved at the level where we take raw materials and create stuff, but what happens after we make these things and people use them? And um, I think the answers are very obvious for a material like plastics. And so we said, okay, we need to step up and take responsibility for this. And um, very quickly I became involved in this space because at the time um, Ghana was really considering strongly some policy instruments around plastics because of the effects on the environment. And as I got deeper and deeper into this space, I started to wonder why more people weren't involved here and why more people weren't doing this. And so for me, it's more so a matter of defining those roles and making them visible to people. And then also being able to see role models of people who look like you, who work in this space that can give you that confidence to know that one day I can do this too. And it's actually something that can be lucrative and it's something that I can be successful at. Um, and so, I mean, it's great that this is an, this is an all uh, women panel. We all work in waste and we're all very, very passionate about what we do. Um, people need to see more of that. Thank you so much for your contribution. And, and Heather, you're coming from the policy side. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I actually worked for the United States Congress before I ventured into my waste uh, adventure. And one of the things I know is that even in politics, particularly policy, um, you see women making gains across the world, but we're still a little bit slow uh, here in Africa. What has been your experience with getting women interested in waste? And what are some of the key tactics you think that maybe we should use or look at uh, to increase the number of women participating in this space? Thanks. I think it's all about being targeted and being strategic. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. That's quite clear. And we're not going to do it all today. So what the approach that we try to take in the national, the Ghana National Plastic Action Partnership is to lay that out bare and say, where are the gaps and be very specific about what activity and who and the resources are needed to really unlock this space. And then you, you pull that out and it becomes this long chain that's very tiresome and terrifying, I think, when you start. And you just have to say, what can we do first? Where can we have the biggest impact in the shortest amount of time to keep us all enthused and excited 
with the resources that are available for us and be confident that I can start here on block one and we're gonna get to the end of the chain eventually. And I think that that's what's often missing is not having that really strategic perspective of how we're engaging. Uh, and on top of that, I think so many of the points raised by Ms. Brown and Ms. Coleman are really spot on. I mean, we have to also target our communication for, for these positions, for opening up these roles and target women Women and let them see that they can be successful. It is a lucrative career. There's lots of money in the space, um, but it's also not only exciting, but it's also creative and strategic. It's really an opportunity to be able to apply that like critical thinking hat and change the way that things are happening at a very large scale because everyone produces waste. Everyone's got to manage it somehow in their household on the go. And so you really have that capacity to impact society at large. Large. And in Ghana, we all know that that's still a really critical issue. We still have massive widespread pollution in almost all of our public spaces, widespread burning, widespread pollution of the marine environment, flooding. So it's a really tangible issue. And I think we can do a lot more as a community to really target that communication to young girls and reach them where they're at. So is that in secondary school? Is it in the uh, university? Is it at career fairs? And make sure that we're letting women know that we need their perspectives and skill sets to really balance and strengthen um, you know, what we're doing. Right, so much. We've got a question from the panel here, a very insightful question. Uh, so Saylo wants to know what career opportunities are available for a graduate uh, for an environmental geologist? Uh, so if you had to uh, sort of say this, I'm not quite sure I know exactly what an environmental geologist, but I know that it's definitely something probably about studying soil. Uh, or something like this and maybe contamination, but do any of you ladies have uh, feedback on perhaps what are some of the potential um, uh, uh, job opportunities out there? I, I do, I think I can weigh in here, uh, Cordy, and then uh, Betsy, I see that you also wanted to make some comments, so. No, the network was not too good. Okay, sure, yes, I'm so. I'm getting some feedback for you. So let's go to Heather and then come back. Yeah, and I'm happy because I have a plug. Um, but at the, I mean, the first thing that I'm really thinking about is, is a landfill engineer or somewhere on the landfill site to make sure that these facilities are sanitary, that we're not leaching toxins into our groundwater or releasing them into our air. There's a huge need in Ghana because we've actually only got one sanitary landfill for the entire country. Uh, of course, the ambition of the country is to move away The, the classic dispose model where we're sending things to a landfill, but I think it'll be some years ahead of us before we really reach that goal, but it continues to be a huge need across the globe, across the region. Um, but also when we're looking at pollution control mechanisms, I think that that directly starts to touch the environmental space uh, very well. And then on top of that, something that's right now immediate is the Ghana NPAP is hiring. We're hiring two new positions. That's an engagement lead and a communication specialist that might not be the perfect fit for an environmental geologist, um, but you can find that on our, our LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, um, or, or private message me and I can send you the, the link. So if you know anyone who's looking for work in the space and definitely who's a woman, that'd be great. Um, there is that one opportunity. Thank you so much for that, Heather. Not sure if uh, the feedback is from everyone or it's just me, um, but I think that you made some great points that uh, plastic, that the Ghana National Plastic Action Partnership is currently hiring and that people should continue to keep their eyes out. Um, you also mentioned collaborations with university and research institutions, and there was a follow-up question about uh, types of partnerships with research institutions. Um, Ajua and Betty, I'd like you to respond to this because I know that this is something um, that both of your organizations have done. I know that you believe in partnerships, particularly with educational universities. Uh, if I've muted you, please unmute yourself accordingly. Hello, Cody. Hello, Cody. Can you repeat your question, please? Yes, please. 
the question was, what are your positions on partnering or do you have any existing partnerships with universities or research institutions that actually address some of these issues or maybe include more women? Oh, okay. 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 Thank you very much, Cody. So I, I'm going to use uh, IRECOP, for example, uh, as a case study in this. Um, what we have done is that once the recycling process is completed, you still have some allowable fraction of residual waste, for example, that ends up in the landfill. Now, what we are doing in partnership with CSIR and the University of Ghana is to look at how can we alternatively use these resources in creating value that will support our operations, for example. So we realized that the characterization of the residual material indicates that we can use it. It has a lot of PTL potential, about 30% PTL potential, that is plastics to liquid, and that we can use the residual material to create diesel to refuel some of our heavy moving equipment on site. And so we have done this research for quite some time with these institutions, and I think that for a country that hasn't done too well in circular economy, a lot of research and partnership with these academic organizations and institutions is excellent for us to cut the way forward on how you know, we are going as a country and to make all the mistakes and correct them as quickly as possible and then get it right at a certain point. So collaboration with this institution is very critical at this stage when we are all trying to migrate to the higher level on the value chain. I think Betty covered it quite well, and it seems that um, we're having some technical issues. So unfortunately, Cordy dropped off and I think is trying to reconnect at the moment. But um, Betty, I, I think you, 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 said, you said it all right. Um, there is a need for data in this space and especially around circular economy. I think one uh, essential gap is in the innovation that's needed to be able to close the loop on many different materials. This is a concept that we're trying to develop and really the way that it can work or to create a business case, we need that end value. And so what are the different um, new spaces that those materials that were previously considered waste can go into and the cusp or the start of developing those typically comes from research and academic institutions, where sometimes in-house, they've already been looking at some of these things, and we have the opportunity to take the things they've done at pilot scale and actually create businesses and to scale them up. And so there is really a core opportunity there. And um, Heather, I saw you uh, type into the chat because I think the question also related to how academic institutions are helping in the gender um, mainstream evaluations as well, right? So maybe you might want to touch a little bit on some of the institutions that you highlighted. I was actually, thanks Adra. I was actually addressing institutions that I know are very involved in, in waste related research, resource recovery, circular economy. Um, many of those are also touching on gender issues. It is an emerging kind of discussion point uh, really globally, but also in country. Um, but just to name a few that we collaborate with a lot. And I was actually late to this call because I was in a discussion with several of these universities. So it's a bit funny. Um, but the University of Ghana is leading a lot of uh, incredible research. KNUST up in Kumasi, Presbyterian University, Cape Coast University, the Institution of Sustainable Development Studies. I think I've said that right. Um, and then CSIR is definitely a huge one. And you know that they have 21 institutions institutions and multiple are leading work related to waste. Um, BRR I've worked with a lot, that's the Building and Road Research Institute. They also have the Institute of Industrial Research, uh, which I know supported Jacor Venture to build out their recycling plant. So there's a ton of research going on in the country. Um, and one of a, a great resource, um, obviously Google Scholar, but then there's um, uh, ResearchGate, which I know a lot of Ghanaian um, um, academics are using a lot. And so you can go in and see who's doing what. Um, but just to give you some indication, in 2016, when I first started working on plastics issues in Ghana, I did a, a primary litter res, uh, research and I found, I think, over 350 publications on the topic published by Ghanaian authors. So there's a lot of research in the space.
That's really great to hear, Heather. And I think you actually um, highlighted some of the institutions that we partner with as well um, as Gripe um, in, in being able to accomplish our aims and goals. So as um, Cordy is actually uh, working to come back online, uh, one of the yes, things I, I know back, that- I believe. Oh, I perfect. Thank you so much, Adula. I appreciate it. <laughs> you see, this is why women rule the world. You see how we just picked up for each other? Um, really appreciate that. And I think you guys actually touched on some amazing institutions. Um, one of the things I also suggest is that uh, there are certain schools that are really known for research that I know Environment 360 uh, has developed relationships with. Uh, one of those is the Institute of Environmental and Sanitation Studies uh, at University of Lagan. Another school that we work very closely with uh, is UDS, uh, their environmental program as well. So I think that if you definitely have an interest on working on research projects or seeing what's already out there, um, I think that these things are uh, uh, really out there if you really look. I think one of the key things that um, this plays into these questions is that women aren't finding out about the opportunities. Um, as mentioned, I see that women typically shy away from field work. Um, how do we make field work more attractive to women? Um, because I know we all look very pretty today, um, but there are definitely times where we have to go into the field. Uh, and this is a lot of non-traditional environments. So we're talking about slums, we're talking about landfills. Um, maybe share with me your first perception um, when you were actually starting into this um, and how that perception has changed as a, as a woman um, over the years. <laughs> uh, yes, Cody. So for uh, some of us who, uh, by no fault of us, look the way we, we, we look, you see, we encountered a lot of uh, mockery in the beginning. I remember I entered the office of a certain big woman and then the first thing she said, how are you able to do this job with your makeup and all that? This job is not for people who look prim and proper, you know? And then uh, I had the opportunity uh, in that same week to have gone onto the landfill and they, they thought I, I wouldn't be able to deliver the reason for which I went there. And it was a waste segregation project, you know? And people seeing me, you know, um, picking the waste and looking for its characterization and all that was amazing because they thought, ah, so what are you doing here? I thought, you know, waste is supposed to be for people at the very lower end. And uh, even the women amongst them were surprised to see that some of us come onto the landfill uh, to do this kind of research. So yes, it is, it is, the stigma is, is, is real and uh, people see us in a certain light. But you see, we also need to drum the effects and the benefits for having a lot of women in the space by the results of what we do. For example, when I joined IRECOP in 2019, we have done extensive research and we have come up with three product grants, you know, and that took me going onto the field for a long time with my team to, for example, uh, pick uh, cocoa peats, that's the coconut husk that has been dumped into our environment, study them for a long time, uh, shred them, pulverize them, co-compost these uh, cocoa pits with uh, compost to see if it can serve any purpose for the nursery industry. For example, it took us, it took us picking um, uh, coconut husk from Nima, from uh, Legon, and so many other places in Accra and being on the field to do this research. By the end of the day, this product is going to serve as an excellent, you know, um, uh, um, potting media for the seedling industry. And so I think that once we do what we do well, the results will show. And we shouldn't get dis discouraged, you know, um, um, when people see us the way they do, but let us show people the results of why we are doing what we are doing and the results will show, I think. So uh, Ajua, can you please share your first experience and then we'll move to Heather as well. Sure, Cordy. So for me, I feel like I came from a frying pan into fire. My background is in chemical engineering and way before I even decided to become a chemical engineer, I wanted to be in the plant. I've seen too many engineers who would study and then do something else. And 
I actually got the degree because I wanted the practical aspect of it. So I spent about two or three years in the plant, 12 hour shifts, hard hats, steel toe boots, you know, all of it, right? The heavy lifting, um, rubbing shoulders with the guys, being the only woman on the shift for all of those years. And um, it really taught me some valuable lessons. Um, first of all, about uh, the perceptions or expectations for women in that field. So the job description um, that they provided to me hopefully is the same type of job description that was provided to a man who stepped up to also take that role, right? Because it had um, some considerations around how much you could lift and what you could do. And I feel like those types of things can be discouraging to a woman trying to enter that field. If you feel that you're limited, um, even simply from your physical strength or from what you're capable of doing biologically, that is something that can deter you from trying to go into a particular field. And so um, I think that it's important to ensure that the way that we put out roles like this um, in describing them in the job descriptions makes it friendly to everyone, to, to all genders to apply to. And then thinking about moving from that into coming into the waste space. Um, Bessie said it best, when you're on the landfill as a woman, walking on those heaps and rummaging through all of it, um, people look at you and it's because they think, you know, what is she doing here? <laughs> Why are you doing this work? And it's really a work of passion. And I think that once you turn the conversation from that physical act of doing work in something that people consider as dirty, to actually um, bringing out those factors of what the end goal of what you are doing is, people start to also buy into it, right? They start to understand that as long as they're humans, we will consume. And as long as we consume, there will be waste. And so in looking at this actual issue, you should see it as your, your prerogative. You should see it as something that you need to play a role in turning around. And I think for me, um, any inhibitions I had around going to a landfill because it was smelly or, or because of um, whatever other factors actually changed because I knew what my end goal was. And if we can make th that more visible to people, it, it, it will definitely take away some of that stigma from that type of work. Great, and Heather, uh, I know that you've done quite a lot of field work in Ghana uh, and you probably get the double whammy um, being the minority and then being a woman, uh, the double minority in this case. So what are some of your experiences and, and how do you handle them when you're on the field? Uh, I've worked in waste in the U.S., in Europe, and in Ghana, uh, and a little bit in Asia, and it's the same everywhere, so it's not unique in Ghana. I remember my very first waste, um, it was a, an industry symposium, and I think there were a couple hundred people there, and I was still, I was finishing up my bachelor's degree, and that was my first official job in waste management, um, but working for a think tank, so not in, a, in the field, but in the office. And I was so excited to go to this industry event and say there's 500 people there. I think there were like 40 women. And out of the 40 women or out of the 500, I think there were less than 100 who were under like 50. So I stood out <laughs> by miles in every way. And I think everyone found it very distracting. And that is often how it is when you enter a space, if it's a boardroom, if it's you know a committee that's writing a policy, uh, if it's a landfill or recycling center, or if you're going you know, into the, the Zongo um, to talk to community members, it can be very distracting. But what I try to do is take that to my advantage. People see, they're looking, they're interested, and uh, exactly as you said, Betty, you have to come to the game. I come to the game with everything that I've got. And very quickly, people can normally understand that I know something. I don't know everything, but I'm bringing something to the conversation. And as Adria said, I'm bringing passion and honesty. And I want to figure something out because that's I work as a problem solver. And I find that I you know, get over that um, some of those limitations normally pretty quickly. 
you've always got a few bad eggs um, and they're normally at the top and, and kind of crackly and old um, and you just have to deal with them. But for the most part, most people also want to get stuff done. They want to be successful um, and they, they see, you know, all the partners at the table as being able to help to do that. And so I really think um, you know, sometimes it's unfortunate being a minority, you have to work extra hard, you have to bring extra to the table, it's not fair, um, but I think it is the state of play, but if you do that, it pays off, because then people are really kind of impressed, and you do have an added advantage of really catching notice just because you're different. Uh, and on field work, I've always loved field work. Um, so from the very beginning, I was so excited to get into a recycling plant, to get into the landfill. And still today, my best days are always like, I need to go to a site for any reason and talk with real people on the ground and get out of these, you know, more intellectual kind of strategy conversations, which I love. Um, but the, the field is the heartbeat. It's where the action is happening. And you really walk away from a day feeling like you did something. Great. One of the things I think I loved across all of the women's testimonies is really the fact of just bringing your A game. And I think that that's really all you can do um, when you're coming to the field and you know that you're different. Um, so can I ask, so do any of you feel as if you have to work twice as hard to be recognized for your work? or to be heard within a room. Uh, I know Heather said that she mentioned that it can be distracting. Um, Betty and Andrea, do you feel the same way as well? <laughs> Very much so sometimes, you know. Um, sometimes when you have meetings and all that and they, they tell you, okay, the general manager is coming, I'm sure in their minds they're expecting this muscular um, <laughs> man to appear and then they see this um, little girl, you know, coming to the table and talking about waste and all that. Yes, I know it, it, you have to work twice as hard to be recognized because the field is, whether we like it or not, male dominated. In fact, I went to a meeting recently where, with industry players, where we were just two, you know, talking about recycling, just two of us, two women, myself and City Waste, Vivian just two of us talking about recycling and all that. And we're having a conversation on, look, there is the need for us to bring in a lot of women into this sector so that we can form a constituency and get our voices heard. As it is now, there are just a few of us. Yes, we have the ideas. Yes, we know what we are doing. Yes, we know the roadmap, but will we be heard the way we want to be heard when we are just a few of us? So um, um, let me use this platform to also encourage, you know, other women, all the engineers, all the polymer engineers, all the geologists. I had a geologist who was just making an inquiry. Yes, you know, we are, we are into composting, for example. So, you know, we need people to study the soil structure and all those things. There, there are a lot of employment opportunities in the field we are in. And we are encouraging them to join us to form that constituency and make our voices known about what our needs are so that we can become more relevant in the industry that we are positioned. Thank you so much for that. Adua, what about yourself? Do you think it's distracting or, or do you think that you're working twice as hard as a man would uh, in the same waste management field? Absolutely. And I think that that, that, that innate need to, to do twice twice as much or to, um, you know, to run faster, be better, it happens with all minorities within any space where, you know, you're, you're the underdog or people are looking to you to see what you are bringing to the table or what you're going to do. And so uh, for that reason, yes, this is also my reality, but I feel that when um, there's a purposeful effort, first of all, to identify that that gap exists, um, which I think takes us back to the beginning when we highlighted that as part of the work that the Ghana NPAP is doing, there's a gender uh, baseline assessment that's being done. I think recognizing that the issue exists is the first part because there are people who are blind to the fact that this space um, has a gap, that there, there aren't a lot of women who step up to work in this space. And so making that bare and making that known is the first step. And then moving from that to actually taking actions to closing those gaps, right? So for me, um, as much as um, 
you know, I feel that we carry the mantle because we're, we're, we're part of the few to, to be able to put the name of women out there within this space. We also have a role to ensure that the systemic parts of ensuring that more women can come on board actually change. Thank you so much. So we're wrapping up our program here. So we've got four more minutes. So I want to give each of you women one minute to tell us what is your perfect strategy for tackling plastic waste and building a circular economy in Ghana? We'll start with you, Madam Betty, then we'll move to Heather and Adjua will wrap us up. Right. So thank you very much, Cody. It's been a very interactive uh, session and I've really enjoyed myself. Yes, so yes, plastic waste. We are excited about the new plastic policy and uh, our hope is that it will help regulate the space better. Um, what IRECOP is doing with regards to plastic waste is to invest in a lot of research. As I said, we need people who are sector specific, polymer engineers to research into what extra things can we do with the plastics that come. You know, we are all pelletizing, we are all uh, 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 shredding, we are all, what else can we do that is innovative and impactful? Are we looking at um, plastic to pavement blocks? Are we looking at plastics to roofing sheets? What are the new trends? And Thank you so and much for, for that, Betty. Research is your I number one key. Now we're gonna bounce on over to Heather so that we remain on time. Oh, oh, I, did, I, I couldn't get to say what I wanted to say, but it's okay. <laughs> Don't worry, it's we'll okay, do follow up. Okay. Well, I, I wanted, <laughs> okay, that's okay. That's Heather, yeah. one minute, what's gonna be your perfect solution to tackling uh, plastic waste and helping build a circular economy? That, there's two, I'm sorry, I can't give you one. At the collective <laughs> level, what all of us can do is manage your own waste properly. Take responsibility, understand what you're buying, understanding how you're using it. Put it in your pocket. If you're out and about, put it in a bin. Preferably find a supplier like Environment 360 who can recycle it for you or have drop-off bins where you could take it to be recycled. That's what each of us can do every day. Um, and what the National Plastic Action Partnership is doing is twofold. One is having a strategic national action roadmap. Again, looking at that strategy, what do we need to do in the short, medium, and long term? Very targeted, that will have the biggest impact. And secondly, how do we bring in large-scale financing to get the infrastructure on the ground that we need? And Ajua, you're up. <laughs> so, Cardi, I think I'll close us off um, by maybe saying, giving a point that summarizes all that's been said. And I think the key here is collaboration. Um, no single person has the answer to all of this. No single solution is a silver bullet. And so we really need everybody at the table. And so collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. I think that's what I'll, I'll leave us with. And thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us today on our conversation on the role of women in the circular economy. I'm Courtney Aziz, the founder and executive director of Environment 360. I think we had a very fruitful conversation today. For those of you interested, the uh, recording will be on our YouTube as well on our Facebook by tomorrow uh, so that you can look and share with friends and then refresh. Uh, as we wrapped up, the top key strategies we think for tackling plastic pollution and supporting a, a circular economy is research from the uh, opinion of Madam Betty Brown from IREPOP, uh, manage your own waste as well as looking at large scale financing and a clear strategic action roadmap uh, where the final words of Madam Heather Troutman, the program manager for the Ghana National Plastic Action Partnership, and then Ajua Coleman, who serves as a sustainability and advocacy manager as well as country manager for Gripe, uh, or I'm sorry, country manager for Ghana and president of Gripe believes in collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Thank all of you women for your time today. It's been such a lovely conversation. I hope that together we've sparked some women to be uh, more interested. If you'd like to get in contact with any of these women, uh, please feel free to email environment360 at info at environment360gh.org uh, and we can pass your request and, and inquiries along to them uh, to respond accordingly. Thank you all for your time today. It's been a fabulous hour and we look forward to engaging with you more in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cordy. It's been great. Thank you for having us. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.